morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, so good to see you. So good to hear you. And thank you for being here. I would like to say I woke up this morning feeling introspective and having this, you know, inward winter kind of morning. But really, it was like a bear being woken up out of hibernation. <laughs> and I just was, I'm all, I felt, ugh. Just, I don't know what it was. It was kind of overwhelming, not angry, but just low. But then, wow, being here, even your medley in the beginning, I was like, yeah, I know these songs and singing them all in my head. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so I'm here to do the invocation. My name is Cynthia Lakar, and I'm a practitioner here for Spiritual Li Centers for Spiritual Living, Light on the Mountains, as you all know. So let's go ahead and feel ourselves grounding in. Feel yourself in your chair. Feet on the ground, and take a moment to invoke. Hmm. As we gather here on this beautiful morning, I recognize the powerful presence of God. And God is that constant, always present, always creating, always cause and effect everything that ever has been, everything that ever will be. I know that God is here in perfect form individualizing as you in your life, just as it is in me and all of the life on this beautiful planet. It is from this grace-filled place that I give thanks for Reverend John and our practitioner team, our musician team, especially violins, <laughs> Leadership Council, past and present and future. Mac and our children's program, our technicians, managing the technology that allows me to be here, whether I am or not. I give thanks for those who give financially, providing operating capital. And I give thanks for each and every member of our spiritual family who make us who we are a true center of that hub of spiritual living. I bless this time together, and with deep gratitude together we say, and so it is. All right. So I, I bring this guy up a lot. I'm always talking about Mark Nepo, which is so ironic, because when I was first introduced to him, I thought, I thought differently. <laughs> I, would, I didn't really appreciate it quite as like I did, do now. Um, this Book of Awakening is a daily read, and on January 26th there, and 27th, there's a two-part Being Kind, Being Kind Part 1 and Being Kind Part 2. And this week, during the meditation, which I learned that some, I, I, <laughs> we're doing Winter Feast, or sorry, Feast for the Soul this, this year, which is exciting, and there's about six, six households that I can see joining us. Um, every day we're doing a live meditation, so if you'd like to join us, just go to the website and there's a link. Um, for some reason, the midweek meditations are not getting emails, so I'll have to work on that piece, but I get an email saying that we're live on the other days, and so that might help too. But anyway, um, I mentioned part of this during that meditation this week, and I decided it was worthy of repeating. Um, so being kind. You often say, I would give, but only to the deserving. The trees in your orchard say not so, nor the flocks in your pastures. They give that they may live, for to withhold is to perish, by Khalil Gibran. And he goes on to tell a little story about himself, and apparently about me, because I like this, um, and maybe you too. This, the great and fierce mystic William Blake said, there is no greater act than putting another before you. This speaks to a selfless giving that seems to be at the base of meaningful love. Yet, having struggled for a, li uh, for a lifetime with letting the needs of others define me, I've come to understand that without the healthiest form of self-love, without honoring the essence of life that this thing called self carries, the way a pod carries a seed. Putting another before you can result in damaging self-sacrifice and endless codependence. I have in many ways over many years suppressed my own needs and insights in an effort not to disappoint others even when not asked to. 
This is not unique to me. Somehow, in the course of learning to be good, we have all been asked to wrestle with the false dilemma, being kind to ourselves or being kind to others. In truth, though, being kind to ourselves is a prerequisite to being kind to others. Honoring ourselves, in fact, the only la lasting, honoring ourselves is, in fact, the only lasting way to release true selfless kindness to others. It is, I believe, as Men Mencius, the grandson of Confucius says, just as the water unobstructed will flow downhill, we, given the chance to be what we are, will extend ourselves in kindness. So the real and lasting practice for each of us is to remove what obstructs us so that we can be who we are, holding nothing back. If we can work toward this kind of authenticity, then the living kindness, the water of compassion, will naturally flow. We do not need discipline to be kind, just an open heart. So go ahead and center yourself for a moment. Go within. Close your eyes if you'd like. And think about that water of compassion that is the pool of the love in your heart. And as you breathe in, imagine it flowing out as you exhale without intent into the air about you. It's easy to be kind. Hmm. Now let's join me please in the affirmation on your insert. We're going to do both affirmations in red in the box right below the blue the affirmation for January and the youth program intent statement which we are so excited about so together I release what no longer serves me in order to make room for something amazing we are a welcoming community where youth and family grow and thrive together all right. Thank you, spiritual family. Thank you, Cynthia. Good morning, everyone. Um, a thought of the day. I, I should not stand on the cord. That is the first. Ah, that's much better. Um, I have a million thoughts. Let's see if I can put them all together like a good stew. 23 years ago, uh, 22 and a half years ago, I moved here uh, to slow down. <laughs> At least that's what I thought at the time. Um, I was wrong. Um, or I've taken me 22 and a half years to fail at my task. Um, and I'm grateful for the opportunities, each and every one that have come along the way. This week I can sit mostly in gratitude for the fact that uh, I am over at the spot playing cabaret and so is she. <laughs> and so I am the luckiest person on the planet to wallow in my Alyssa time. And um, yeah, so that's good stuff. Um, so this intention of uh, slowing down, reframe that, reposition that. And over the years, I have become better at doing things which I care about, which matter to me. Um, I am better at saying no now than I was 22 and a half years ago. And that's good for me, for balance. Um, but Alyssa and I were talking this morning, too, about how sometimes you get to circle back and revisit things. And sometimes the memory is covered by a layer of what was going on on the last experience. And sometimes you have to peel away that layer which isn't connected to you anymore so you can look at the same location the same situation the same opportunity the same relationship uh, with a different light um, and that gift of discovering that uh, in most situations not everything is either good or bad 
there's a combination. And we, get to, we have those opportunities to revisit, to, uh, to reassess, uh, to reframe, to get to know, um, all those things. And uh, my, um, well, Alyssa and I are talking a bunch over the last <laughs> week, and uh, talking about uh, looking at that idea that things that others might see as a challenge, as a gift. John's blog today, which I'm sure he's going to talk about, so I won't talk about it too much. I'd hate to steal what he was going to say. Um, see if this all goes together. Well, who you know, is luckier than me? <laughs> you have just given us a shot in the arm this morning. Okay. Well, so when I moved here a million years ago, I already knew that, that the RL was way too busy, because, and just as a new kid, because we went to... The Liberty Theater, they were used to show movies once or twice a week, and who was the projectionist? <laughs> R.L. and John. And I thought, what do you like? This is dating me, but are you Mr. Haney from Green Acres or something? I mean, you're always doing everything. So um, um, hopefully you're not doing everything as to that level. I am loving everything I do. Good, good. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody at home. Uh, comfy in your little spa robes with coffee. Uh, it's a great morning. So. An interesting line popped out to me from my personal reading this week, and it really kind of got me on a whole other tangent, and even beyond what I wrote on my... No giggling over there. <laughs> yeah, be good. Be good. Um, anyway, so it just kind of popped out at me, and even beyond what I wrote in my blog this week. So get this. It said, answered prayer is risky business. Answered prayer is a risky business. And I immediately went to um, thinking about that movie, Risky Business, from the early 80s. And I even had to go online to like familiarize or refamiliarize myself with the plot just a little bit. I didn't like jump into Risky Business at all. But um, this was one of the first big Tom Cruise movies. And he, he was playing a senior in high school. And he's, I guess his life dream came true because his parents were going to go away for a few days. <laughs> and they decided that they would let him be home alone. And of course, from another movie, you know how home alone can go. And, um, and of course, again, every teenager's dream. Parents are gone, I've got this big house. And of course, the thing that really personified his sense of freedom, as you may remember before things started to happen, is that since he was home alone, he could sing and dance in his boxer shorts in the living room. And so that was like the ultimate freedom. Like, you know, you've got a family at home, you're gonna keep your boxer shorts to your bedroom sort of thing. And of course, it, as we all know, um, st started to think, well, gosh, I could do this thing that I never get to do with my parents here. And of course, the famous line always is, what could go wrong? <laughs> and Basically, there are a series of unintended consequences that I don't need to go into. It kind of makes me interested to watch the movie again. And all of these un consequences to the point shady characters he meets with, they steal the furniture out of his parents' big home and all this. And of course, it all comes together at the end and he, the furniture gets back and put in place and it's not like 10 minutes, everything's back in place and the parents come home. It's like, oh, how was your time off? Oh, it's fine, kind of quiet around here. But the one thing that you got from the end of the movie, yes, I'm sure he had learned some lessons, but you could tell from the twinkle of his eyes that there's probably going to be some risky business still ahead in his future. <laughs> so why have I obsessed a little bit on this plot a bit? Well, to look at prayer being risky business, and so let's look at prayer a little bit differently, it is basically a statement to the universe to mess with your life. It's saying I'm ready to change and you are my partner in change and in the major change in a sense it can feel a bit like risky business because there might be some unintended results from giving yourself over to saying I am open to having my prayers answered. So let's kind of redefine prayer a little bit and expand it as 
spiritual, larger spiritual beings like we like to think we all are. So we have been often raised to believe that prayer is a very limited, small, transactional thing that we do. We try to figure out something we want, and we put it out there, however you are. I pray to God, I pray to angels, I pray to the universe, I pray to my candle, whatever you do. And you hope that that, that statement will have, will have a result to it. And we like to think of it as very controlled. Think of it like in the forest we like controlled burns. You know? We're just going to get rid of some of this brush a little bit. And then the forest will be healthy. But as you know, sometimes those controlled burns are not controlled burns. In fact, as we know up here, uh, they can turn into some major events. But we like to think that our prayer or affirmations or meditations, that it's a, it's a controlled burn. I'll just get this little thing, and I will stretch this much, and I'll move on to the next thing. But it is risky business in that as you give yourself over to a higher vibration in your consciousness and living, that it's not so much just about thinking I want a thing. It's about opening yourself up to a different way of experience. And I'm going to remind you, as we've talked the last couple of weeks, as we've gone into this 40-day period of Feast for the Soul, to come up with your intention for this period, what you would like to invite in, and not so much an object or a thing, but a spiritual quality, a way of being. So I'm just reminding you of your homework again, and if you haven't done it yet, it's never too late. <laughs> and so imagine a whatever that larger thing could be. I mean, it could be unconditional love. It could be a, a greater sense of flow and understanding in your life. Those kind of larger things. And can you begin to see how it could be risky business and an uncontrollable fire because you let it loose in your life, but in a good way. You know, I, so when I say unintended consequences, these are ultimately good consequences. Except sometimes as humans, we might be a little scared and think not so much at first. But, but think of it this as it, it only can be a good thing. And as we do this, it, it really relates to another part of my of the reading, the personal reading I did this, this week. That, so what does that saying yes actually open yourselves up to? It's really not this transactional thing, I pray this, I get this sort of thing. It's, it's kind of going to an upper level of consciousness where... I thought of this metaphor that of reading this week of bringing you to what I was growing up to think of the kingdom or the kingdom of God or, or the heavenly experience. And that this metaphor is not about a place of real estate you get sent to at a certain point in your existence. It's, it's really not. That this consciousness or kingdom is this understanding that the divine exists in you and at all things. And as it says in the New Testament, it's at hand, meaning it's there for your embodiment at any time. It's not something that you are a good person and that then you die and you get to go someplace. It's this state of consciousness, this upper level of being that is always available that we can decide to embody and uplift our experience at any time. And so that is, again, so much different from this idea of prayer of, I do this prayer, I get this thing, and if I'm a good person, I get to earn going someplace. In fact, it was funny, a few years ago, a good friend of mine, Pat's in kindergarten, and we went all through Catholic school together and everything, and she called me a few years ago, and this shows you how that thinking and how my thinking has changed. She says, just wanted to tell you that, that um, my grandmother has gone to her reward. And the first thing in my mind was, did she win the lottery? <laughs> <laughs> and no, that's kind of that other way of thinking of the kingdom of heaven, is that you earn it and you cash in. So this, I guess you could say you can cash in at any time. And to really think that, that it is such a small way of thinking that it's just a place of real estate that you go to. I remember, again, in, in go, going to school as a, as a kid, how the teachers, they really try to position and encourage this idea of you really wanted to earn your reward, in a sense, to be like grandma and go get your reward. And it was such a quandary for me, I remember in second, second and third grade, because it sounded so boring to me. And they really tried to like play it up. Streets of gold, 
choirs of heaven every, you know, angels floating around everywhere. And it just, they were really trying to sell it. So you really need to be a good boy in, in school here. And I just remember thinking, well, you know, that sounds like an interesting day trip. <laughs> but uh, I'm not sure, you know, just like in grade school, you'd get on the bus and go to the Natural History Museum. Or, or, and it's like, but you don't want to live at the museum. It's a nice day. And it's interesting, and you take notes. And I thought that, and, and this really went through my mind in, in, in my desk in second and third grade. I thought, well, they at least let me bring my Lego collection. <laughs> because I need something to do. I mean, how, how long can you get the choir of angels before it's like, uh, uh, sort of thing. And it, it was this really serious thing with me. And I kept thinking, well, but then they told me the alternative was really not something you wanted. And I thought, could there be an even third alternative that they're just not telling us about? That's what went through my mind in second and third grade. But where I came to at that point, spontaneously, was a different version of it without even knowing about it. So of course we'd go to Sunday services and mass, and at that time, a million years ago, they were still in Latin. So as a seven-year-old, I had no clue what was going on. And of course, as a kid, you're like, ah. And, you know, my mom keep popping me lifesavers to kind of keep me going here. But at some point, I kind of just settle in to being still. And really, as I think of it now, spontaneously in a type of meditation. Where, and again, I had no thought of this, of what I was doing. And that I was simply just present there. And I know that we are at church in a sense to kind of do the God thing. But for me, it was not about what was happening up on the altar. Suddenly, I just felt whatever this was, and I just felt it as just a presence, what, what just was. And if I was still, I was there. And what's even interesting, people ask me, well, how long did you know you want to be a minister? And at that point, it was funny. And as I look up at the priest up there, somehow I knew I was going to do that, but I wasn't going to be wearing that outfit. <laughs> you know, like all the stuff and the things. And, and I, so um, <coughs> that there was just a connection there. And that's what Spirit God, the divine, was, came to be. Um, and I was just hanging out in church. And it came to be the nucleus of what my beliefs would develop into. So in a sense, what I kind of stumbled on as a seven-year-old is what I see as the kingdom. Ever-present, always there. Um, if you can calm down long enough, you can, you can feel it and experience it and have it in your own life. And it's not just this small transactional thing, that it is something that if you truly embody, and we do so in degrees, that I guess you could say it is risky business because it's just going to blow you away to a different way of being. Again, good risky business. So this is what, in a sense, as I'm thinking of, this is what happens in the consciousness of the kingdom. And again, it's not the place over there. It's not the, the choirs of angels and all that sort of thing. It's just the state of consciousness where we are better grounded and open to the truth of who we are, where we're open to healing, where we are open to our best selves. That's what it is. It's ever always available. A couple things that you can realize and you come up against here is to come to the understanding, as difficult as this might be sometimes, is you come to understand that regardless of what the circumstances are in your life and the world, that literally anything is possible. And I don't mean this in like a Pollyanna white lighter sort of way, that you can be part of something amazing happening. That if you can have the thought that healing is possible, healing has already begun. That it's not a waiting around. That you have very powerfully started the process of healing in anything because you have entertained the idea that it's possible. It's that quick. It's that easy. But the, in this infinite possibility is what you start to, in, in your intuition, to understand the possibilities that are best for you. We all go down some crazy rabbit holes, don't we? <laughs> Gee, I'll do that because my best friend is doing it. But as you're kind of in that higher elevation, 
the choices become narrower, not because there are less choices, because you get a clarity of what is yours to do. And when you say anything is possible, there's a good chance that that thing that, that is truly yours to do, uh, there was a good portion of your life that you couldn't even imagine you doing such a thing. That opening up to that higher vibration that says, yes, this sounds like crazy talk, but it's mine to do. In fact, I often say that, you know, people ask me, how do I know if it's my intuition or not, or answered prayer? Like I said, if it scares you a little bit, it's probably the truth, because that means like it's elevating your experience here a little bit. Like, I didn't think I could do that. So if there's a little bit of anxiety, it's like it's probably it. But here's another huge thing that you, that we learn in that, that state of consciousness is we learn our own worth and deservedness. So I was raised in prayer that you ask for this whatever it is, and your next thing is to ponder why, how many reasons why you aren't deserving of it, and it probably couldn't come to you unless if there's, like you get the prayer to a special angel or someone, like there's a really good angel on, on call today that are going to do it just right for you today. So, so if thoughts are things, if you say, state an affirmation or have a prayer of however form you see it, and you say it with all your feeling, and the next thing, there is an energy within you that says it's not possible or you're not deserving of it in some way. Can you see how it kind of balanced it out and it's probably not much going to happen with it? But as human beings, we have been trained on some level to go to, oh, that could never be for me. So being in that consciousness of the kingdom is where we begin to learn our way through that. I just want to... Um, remind us of a little lesson that Rabbi Ravi Sherman gave us in October she was here. She talked about this concept of not being worthy or of, of sin and how um, in her belief and looking at the translation and what we think of as the Old Testament and she as a Jew just thinks of the real Bible um, that it talks about sinning and sinners and she said that the true tra translation of that is not this heaviness. Isn't the word, I, that's why I don't use this word sin because it just, culturally, it just brings us like, oh, you know, I'm just a terrible person kind of thing. And she said, but she pointed out to us that it actually, the correct translation is to miss the mark. And as she also pointed it out, culturally from when that was written, that it, term, it was a term in archery, meaning you missed the mark. You missed the bullseye sort of thing. And just think about it. I mean, think now. How good of an archer are you right now? <laughs> how much training would it take for you to not to hit the mark instead of miss the mark? So I don't know if any of you growing up went to summer camp. My brother and I did, like two weeks every summer. And one of the activities was archery. And it's funny. Try to get funny thing about this camp. So we did <laughs> archery and we shot rifles. And I thought, and we were ten. <laughs> <laughs> Again, what could go wrong? Uh, we never killed each other, even by accident. Um, I have to say, or at least we weren't told if something happened when we weren't there. But this is how it went. So we've got all these 10, 11-year-olds at an archery thing, and you've got, you, you've got the bullseye things on these um, hay bales. And so it was very, the teacher was great. So it had us really organized, so we're not like, you know, pointing at each other, get us all pointing the hay bales, and we were each given three arrows. And so it's like, okay, you guys ready? And so can you just imagine what it is, like 15, 10-year-olds, like, do, you know, <laughs> doing three, you know, three arrows a piece? Very few landed on the hay bales, I just want to tell you. <laughs> and, of course, much of that session would be that we then had to all go into the brush behind the hay bales and find our arrows. And we couldn't have another round of madness until we all had our three arrows again. But you know what? Magically, by the end of the two weeks, there were actually some arrows hitting in on the hay bales. So with the right amount of intention, you're going to finally get it. And there wasn't any shame or blame of, oh, I missed the hay bales. It was just like, I didn't expect to hit the hay bales. <laughs> or it was like, I finally hit the hay bales. Let's, let's 
Let's um, celebrate with each other. And by the end of week two, we are kind of hitting the hay bales. And some of us, shocking as it is, even hit the target. So if you can have that sense of lightheartedness with, yes, we make mistakes. Yes, there's things that we do that we need to make amends. But it doesn't mean that we are innately bad or wrong. It just means that we need to try again and elevate our consciousness to something else. And to know that, again, why prayer is risky business, it starts you on a process and journey to learn what you most need to know. Some of these journeys are pretty quick. We can do some of these by brunch today. And others seem to be naggingly long. But they're as long as they need to be. And I know when we are in it, it could seem like it's never going to end. But to try to have this elevated sense of saying, I am in this kingdom or state of higher consciousness, that this is the place where I can find that healing. Saw a really interesting video, I think, yesterday. This young man, 30 ish, and he was very excited that he had inherited his parents' home, the home he grew up in, and he sold it. Right? But he said that his home growing up was a great sense of shame for him. That both of his parents were hoarders. And I mean, like, if you've seen some of the shows, I you know, like magazines literally <coughs> here. And of course, he had his own room, and that's the only place that he felt he had any control. Of course, his room, I don't know what it looked like, but he didn't have the things stacked up. And the other part of the house that he had to spend time was with is that they had one family computer, you know, like a, a desktop, um, and it was set up, I think, in the living room. And he said there was this very narrow pathway leading from his room to the computer. And even at the computer, that he would be overwhelmed with just this shame and, and just being his life out of control in, in this environment. And so he said when his second parent died and, and he um, inherited this house, part of him just wanted to get a bulldozer. I'll sell it for the land. We'll just, it's all junk. It's going. That's a, in fact, I, I think he probably would have liked to have been running the bulldozer mm -hmm. kind of thing. It's like, and, and I haven't had that with some of our stuff that we're having difficult, uh, diff difficulty processing from our past. We just want to bulldoze it. We just want to get rid of it. We just be done with you already. And there's a certain amount that, that is good. But he, but he thought, what if I made it first into the house I always wanted to live in and then sold it to someone new? And so he very painstakingly went through everything and got down to the brass tacks of what it was. And apparently the house structurally was doing pretty well. And so you know, and I guess he was pretty handy and he did a lot of the work himself. You know, new flooring, new good paint, put in a new kitchen. And he showed pictures of this and he showed the before and after. And it, this lovely kind of model home you'd go to buy new homes with somewhere. And it was such a cathartic thing for him then to, and great blessing to share it and hand it over to someone else. And there was something very healing for him to just to go through all these things. And, and it wasn't just about piles of magazine. It was about, um, you know, shame for his family, for himself, and feeling that was there something wrong with him and, and being in this environment? And it was this cathartic thing that was amazing for him. And you could just, what I loved about this video is that there was a lightness about him that was amazing. And it was so similar to um, experience I had years ago. A friend of mine had also inherited from parents a similar house. They were also <laughs> going to, okay, let's get the construction bin and they were going to hire like a, an army of teenagers. Let's just throw it out, you know, throw it out and sell it. And she said, hey, you know, and I just had this all planned. And she says, I don't know why, but I went over to this one magazine and opened it up. And she went like this and out fell a $20 bill. <laughs> and so they started looking through other magazines and they found some more money. <laughs> and then they found some papers like, I've been looking for my birth certificate forever. Oh, here's a picture from 
wherever, and they realized that they just couldn't throw it out. And again, similar to the first thing, so they took like 10 months to go through every magazine. First of all, they found enough money to pay for the refurbishment of the house. There was thousands of dollars there. And they found all sorts of treasures. And it also was cathartic of getting away from just being in a state of shame and left not having worth to look what's hidden in what I saw as a mess. And so speaking to them, instead of it being this chore to just get rid of this stuff, it was just like, I don't know, rediscovering family? Um, like, how could our mother leave this terrible condition to us and then leaving thousands of dollars, I guess, to help clean up the mess? How interesting that if we're willing to be present where we are, what we can find. It's not rarely all good or, or bad. That this thing that we metaphorically call the kingdom is being present and seeing sometimes just the gifts that are there that we can't see. That it is just opening up and seeing something that we were blind to. And as we do so, it is amazing how what appeared to be quote-unquote bad can have a way to start processing out. And I just liked how those two stories were so similar. So I just want to start to leave today with a reading that, that I just love. So first of all, I just want us to think about prayer differently. It is dangerous business, risky business, because who knows what's going to happen? <laughs> You could find thousands of dollars in a stack of magazines. <coughs> I mean, isn't that kind of, that's good risky business, isn't it? But um, I had read, read this a few years ago. We had a, a guest here who did a workshop over a couple days. Um, and some of you may remember this, and she wrote this, and it's called Dangerous Prayers. Again, risky business. And of course, I just want to talk about this a little bit first, because I remember reading this, and someone called me the next day and says, should I be afraid to pray? <laughs> no, you kind of missed the point here. So the whole idea is to know that as you put yourself out there, something so unthought of that can happen that it can almost appear like dangerous. Because it's like, who knew that my life could heal? I mean, amazing. Before I used to make prayers saying, well, if you get time, could you heal me? It's like, no, let's heal. Let's do it right now. Let's get on the road. Let's do it. So I just want to read this and, and, and listen to it in that sense of dangerous prayers, meaning I am putting myself out there for complete transformation, fully willing to give up and leave behind that which no longer serves me. Wouldn't it be great if we could pray like that every day? So I just want to read this. And it came up by Regina Sarah Ryan. Deliver us, O truth, O love, from quiet prayer, from polite and politically correct language from appropriate gesture and form, and whatever else we think you must put forth to invoke or to praise you, meaning. Let us instead pray dangerously, wantonly, lustfully, passionately. Let us demand with every ounce of our strength. Let us storm the gates of heaven. Let us shake up ourselves and our plaster saints from the sleep of years. Let us pray dangerously. Let us throw ourselves from the top of the tower. Let us risk a descent into the darkest regions of the abyss. Let us put our head in the lion's mouth and direct our feet to the entrance of the dragon's cave. Let us pray dangerously. Let us not hold back a little portion, dealing out our lives, our precious minutes, and our energies like some efficient accountant. Let us rather pray dangerously, unsafe, prolific, wasteful, let us ask for nothing less than the infinite to ravage us. Let us ask for nothing less than the annihilation in the fires of love. Let us not pray in holy half measures, nor walk the middle path for too long, but pray madly and foolishly. Let us be too ecstatic. Let us be too overwhelmed with sorrow and remorse. Let us be undone and dismembered and gladly. Left to our own devices on what structures of deceit we have created, what battlements erected, what labyrinths woven, what traps set for ourselves and then fallen into, enough. Let us pray dangerously. Hot prayer, wet prayer, fierce prayer, 
fiery prayer, improper prayer, exuberant prayer, drunken and completely unrealistic prayer. <laughs> Let us say yes again, again, and again, and yes some more. Let us pray dangerously. The most dangerous prayer is yes. So, let's just kind of take this in for a moment. I don't know if I can say much else to make it any clearer. Simply let us know we are present, that we invite that higher consciousness, that we say yes. It may feel a little dangerous, it may feel a little risky, but we say yes. And so it is. Thank you. 